Good morning. For those of you watching on the YouTube channel, you can tell today is casual Friday at the Dr. Dan home offices, doing a little bit of uh, coaching calls this morning and uh, chatting with you real quick. Casual Friday often means it is also psychotherapist supervision Friday. That is the time every couple of months where I get together with uh, a few other therapists, individuals that uh, work next to me or I work alongside that uh, maybe I've taught or trained or have mentored me in some ways. And uh, we all get together and talk about uh, difficult cases that we're working on, maybe try to get some insight or different approaches on how we should be handling things. Uh, and also talk about just how we're doing as professionals in the field, you know, both professionally and personally. And I always like to share that with you because I think that's such an important part not only of, of my role as a therapist and as a coach, but just for everybody. You know, you've heard me say, you know, time and again, we all would benefit from a mentor or coach or even therapist. Um, every hero has their mentor. Luke had Yoda. Harry had Dumbledore. I'm still trying to think of my Marvel reference. So if you can help me with that, that would be great. Um, but this idea is is etched in in human history throughout good mythology and storytelling. Every hero needs a mentor. Um, I have my merry band of therapists that I talk to every couple of months, and hopefully you do too. Um, so that is why today is Casual Friday. And boy, I'll tell you, do I need a little bit of uh, therapist supervision? Um, heck, I, <laughs> I, at this point, should probably be checking back in with the therapist or a coach, but I'll tell you more about that because today's Today's podcast has a lot to do with that. What I wanted to do today is bring you a little bit of a new textbook I'm reviewing. This is a great book, um, a, a new textbook by the uh, couple, um, Maria, doctors Maria and Edward Marshall um, out of Canada, who are also um, teachers at the uh, school where I teach at. Um, this is a great couple who went very deep into the history of logotherapy and uh, even Dr. Frankel's history. I, the, the, the beginning of this book um, has a lot of history that I haven't even read before. So they pulled in a lot of different information and facts to make a quite a comprehensive textbook. I mean, we're looking at nearly 600 pages. Um, so hopefully they'll be offering this course uh, at different places. I'm guessing um, at our school, the Graduate Theological Foundation, or possibly other schools where they might teach. If you're interested and want to pick it up on Amazon, Victor E. Frankel's Logotherapy and Existential Analysis Theory and Practice. You see that cute little caricature of Dr. Frankel um, that I believe he drew himself. Uh, but today I wanted to talk about specifically the chapter on existential dynamics, what you've heard me call neurodynamics in the past. Um, and for me personally, how I use them, how I've had to use them this week, it has not been an easy week for me. So um, I hope you don't mind a little bit of self-disclosure and a little bit of sharing along the lines of um, how I use these. And maybe that will inform you a little bit about how you can use these ideas as well. As you know, that's always my goal is to bring a little bit of mental health and meaning to your day. That's why I started this podcast. So hopefully you take a little bit of this information and can apply it yourself. So for me, I'll tell you, um, this time of year, uh, over the past few years, it has been difficult. Um, four years ago, I'm going to try to be professional here and try to keep it together. But I do apologize a little bit if uh, if you hear some emotion coming through. Um, for me, uh, it's been four years since uh, my mother passed away. It was this time of year. Actually, um, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit uh, more of the story. It was actually Valentine's Day four years ago. My mother had meticulous handwriting beautiful, tiny, um, meticulous handwriting. And so Valentine's Day, four years ago, she sent my daughter some Valentine's cards. And I looked at it and I looked at the address on there. I said, that's not right. And uh, I called my dad right away. I said, hey, did you write this? Because this looks terrible. And he said, no, 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 your mother wrote that. I said, dad, something's not right. This, this is a problem. He said, no, everything's fine. She, you know, maybe she just had a bad day or something. So I don't know, maybe you need to get her into a doctor. And we debated for a little bit. And, and uh, well, she didn't go to the doctor. Um, so Easter of that year, 
she was at my sister's house and uh, my sister called after Easter and said, something's not right. And I said, you know, I've been wondering about that. Um, you know, what are we going to do? She said, I'm taking her to the doctor tomorrow. And she did. And, uh, that doctor visit found cancer. Um, over the next few weeks, we found out uh, apparently it was lung cancer that had metastasized throughout her body and specific, specifically to her brain. Some, uh, some very large tumors in her brain that were obviously causing the behavioral effects and some of the things that we had, we had seen over the past few months. And so, well, it was only a few months later and we lost her of June of that year to the cancer. And during that time, um, I became very conscious. You know, we talk about existential analysis, looking at our own existence. I talked to you about the tragic triad, pain, guilt, and death of logotherapy and logo philosophy, those sufferings that we cannot escape. And it was at that time in my life where I had to face those in a, in a unexpected and frightening way, um, a sad way, a scary way, a way that uh, I recognize I did not cope with well um, shortly after that time in June through July in the summer of that year. Um, and so in the past four years, I have done a lot of my own work to deal with that, to face maybe the guilt that I still had left over of what kind of relationship we had and to process that and deal with that in my way. So you would think four years later, um, I would be, how do we say that in our culture? Over that, um, let's take a quick sidebar. You grieve in your own way. If when we face loss, this is one of the things our culture, most cultures are not good with. Eh, I don't know, some are. Um, our culture is not good with is dealing with death and grieving. We often resort to cliches and they're in a better place and it's going to be okay. And that can sometimes be insulting to the aggrieved. Um, sometimes the best thing we can do is just to sit with somebody who's grieving and allow them to process and if you're grieving if you're in the state of grief you get to choose how long if you feel it goes on too long maybe you seek some help and talk to somebody or if you're hearing that from those around you but i can tell you sometimes a year or two years is still healthy grieving beyond that and maybe you need to be talking to somebody but those that tell you a few weeks or a month or a couple months later you should be moved on well that's just not true I know for me, four years later, um, I feel as though I still remember, I still think about mom often. And, and weeks like this week really bring back the hurt and the sadness. And I'll tell you why. Um, so this week, uh, an individual I've known for a long time, ever since I moved into Farmville, Indiana, uh, has been struggling with cancer. And this week, he let me know that they have decided to discontinue treatment, that it is not effective, and that he will continue to live out his life as best he can, but will also be looking at how he's going to close out and look to hospice. And that was the morning of a pretty busy day. So the good of that was I was able to focus on other areas, focus on other people to do that self-transcendent work that I am blessed to engage in on a daily basis of therapy and coaching. And I did that. And then, of course, by the end of the day, it was something where for me, I just fell apart and had to really dive into what that was about for me. Um, I always teach people that our loss and our hurt, no matter how well we process it, is often brought back to us at other times of loss in life um, or even impending loss. And that's really what pushed me back into doing some very deep reading in logotherapy and spirituality and really trying to, and, and talking, right? That's one of the ways I cope. Um, I hope you don't mind me talking to you about it. Uh, but that's usually a good way how we orient ourselves and our minds, at least for extroverts, as you've heard me say, talking through it helps us process it. If you're more inclined to introversion, um, 
maybe sitting quietly and thinking on your own is the way to do it. So that, that kind of leads into this idea of existential dynamics or that spiritual tension we feel. But let's, let's get a little history first. Um, it's been a while since I've talked about the idea that logotherapy, as we're starting to say now, um, logo philosophy, this philosophy of life, it doesn't have to be just about therapy, but taking these practices and living it as part of your life. And, and we'll talk about why, uh, why it's not just therapy, but it's philosophy. Um, the Marshall share in the textbook that Frankl was the first, the first theor theorist, psychologist, psychiatrist to add this new dimension to his model of the human being and to helping and to therapy. And that concept was the idea of the spirit. Uh, for so much more um, before that, um, we only looked at the mind and the body, right? So it says here that um, Franco conceptualizes the human being as a conscious and deciding being with a certain amount of freedom and limitations. Figuratively speaking, as in the history of evolution, humans have their feet on the ground and their forehead raised toward the horizon of values. That's incredibly spiritual and not necessarily encompassed in, obviously not encompassed in physicality other than we're standing and we have a forehead um, and maybe a little bit in the emotional realm or the mental realm, right? It goes on to say that for centuries, medicine and psychology have focused on limitations deficits and pathology and that's so true isn't it like our medical field focuses on illness and correcting illness thank goodness um, but unfortunately so does psychology and therapy we focus on what is wrong or broken and existential issues are considered from the perspective of religion and separated from the domain of scientific interest right logotherapy logo philosophy this way of life is the first open system that presents a life affirming and positive view of the human being that bridges the sciences and faith traditions and offers a positive existentialist standpoint it affirms that human beings are not free from conditions but they are free to respond to conditions in their attitudes and in their behavior we can take a position towards our environment and towards ourselves. Logotherapy, this area of psychology, of study, of therapy, of life, and of philosophy is the first scientific area, psychological area, to incorporate the human spirit along with the mind and the body. And I think that's important and difficult to define we know it's there we feel it at times in i was listening to a great podcast from uh it was a, a rogan podcast with dr peterson so you know i'm going to listen to that um and and just in the middle somewhere uh, you can see it on my social media I, I, I took it and put it on facebook and insta and linkedin i think but dr peterson says that oh and, and i'm going to have a hard time remember it that we the, the burden of temporal existence is lifted in genuine dialogue, right? So when we have this genuine connection between two people, this conversation, it's physical in that we're speaking, it's mental and we're using our minds, but you know if you, you're in that conversation, there is such a genuine connection and flow that is so spiritual. Um, there are other things too that... The body and mind function according to the laws of physics, chemistry, and biochemistry, right? So we know these things. We know the mind, the brain. I just see mind and brain are different in my mind. Body and physiology are, are obvious, right? Those are the, the, the parts that we can see, feel, touch. That's the part of us that is material, um, as is the brain, whereas, as I see it, the mind connects the brain to the spirit it is the functioning of the brain that we don't we think we understand but we don't always understand right we know the understanding part is neurotransmitters serotonin 
electrical impulses, gray matter, but then conscience and love, humor, connection. We don't always define or understand these things, but we feel it. And I believe that's the connection to the spirit, right? So the, the body and mind function according to the laws of physics and chemistry and biochemistry. Spirit is a metaphysical dynamic. It is not measurable substance within the confines of time and space. Okay, for you scientists out there, this is annoying, right? For you hardcore uh, scientists, like, yeah, no, no, no. We have to be able to measure things. And maybe someday we will, but we can't now. That does not mean it doesn't exist because we know it does, because we experience it. I was going to say we feel it. That would connect it to emotion, but we, we feel it, but we also experience it. We know it's there, but we can't always define it. The dimension of spirit, and, and I want to go a little bit into language here. I wish Rabbi B was here. He was so good at this, right? Spirit, if we go back to the German that Frankel wrote in, um, he did not want that associated with religion. And, and so the, the fact that the marshals in the textbook go back to spirit, Frankel wanted it known more for logos, connection, this more ethereal idea. And that's why he called it the noose. N O O umlaut S, right? Um, there's so many different more words in German to to relate to spirit, um, but in our English, in our American culture, we often associate that with religi religiosity, and that's not what he's talking about. As you've heard me say, religion is how we express spirituality, but that doesn't mean it, it encompasses all of spirituality. Okay, and so when we talk about the spirit, we're talking more about that unique thing that makes us human makes us individuals um it's so much more than just what building we go to on a sunday and, and what our behavior is in that building they go on to say the dimension of the spirit is not characterized by homeostasis or balance but it is dynamic it means it's changing reaching from here and now into the past for resources i think this line is so cool right so as, as you've heard me say it's that that and even if you've seen me do if you're watching YouTube, right? This this tension of where we are now and where we want to be, right? And that that is the spirit seeking to grow. Um, one of the words I used to refer to in his texts were become. We are always in the state of becoming, and that is such a healthy tension. Um, unfortunately, sometimes our culture tells us, well, it's not healthy to feel that tension. You should try for balance and homeostasis. And just, you know, if, if you're not feeling that we have a pill to, to fix it. Um, so the spirit is dynamic, reaching from here and now into the past for resources. So our spirit goes into the past to look at what we have, what we've experienced, what we've learned, what our knowledge is to be able to, to deal with what is now and to look into the future for what is still possible. Oh, that's so cool. This not, dynamicism, dynamicism, sorry, is called neurodynamics, as we say, which is the human spirit's orientation to meaning, creating a healthy tension between being and meaning. Oh, that's so awesome. That is right for me in, in, in the struggle that I'm dealing with this week and suffering. That's what I need to remember. That's what I need to see in my friend who is facing his existence. That, that spirit will go on, that, well, let me dive into the text a bit. So we, we list, the authors list some of the factors of the spirit here. The spirit is not substance, it is dynamics. That's what we said. You can't measure it, you can't touch it, feel it, but darn it, you know it's there. And that's because it is dynamic and changing. It cannot be divided, reduced, or duplicated. Well. I mean, we talk about reduction, reductionism a lot. No, you can't reduce it. It is who we are. We can't duplicate it. We can't divide it. We can't split it into things. You can, you can cut my finger off and, and, well, you know, it's divided. My arm will, my hand will therefore be divided. Um, I can reduce myself by losing weight, um, but I can't reduce my spirit. I can't duplicate it. Spirit is the essence of a person. It is with each person a new creation, not inherited from one's parents or encoded in the genes. 
I read that and, and I think, you know, that whole nature nurture debate, our spirit, who we are, our conscious, our humor, our, our ability to love are all formed by those things. They are formed by our parents. They are informed by our genetic code, but it doesn't create it. Goes back to logotherapy's teachings that we are all singularly unique individuals. And that's that spirit there, that we are irreplaceable. And that is the essence of our spirit. Body and mind refer to what we have. I have a body. I have a mind. But spirit refers to who we essentially and existentially are. I am my spirit. It is, it encapsul encapsulates all that I am. Spirit, nous, comp uh, comprises the inner healthy resources of the person. This is what I love. This is like the toolbox for, for being, for humanity, for being healthy, for wellness. Our spirit contains that toolbox, the inner healthy resources of the person. Body and mind are instruments of the spirit through which the spirit acts in the world and expresses our, itself. So, right, that spirit is the, is, contains the toolbox for healthiness. And then we take that and we do things with our body and mind to become healthy. We talk to people, we connect, we engage in exercise, we eat healthy. That all fuels the mind and body. But it's the spirit that cannot become ill that pushes that. We'll get to that. Our body and mind exist within the constraints of time and space. They are basically a closed system, which is more or less determined, constrained, vulnerable, and subject to illnesses and disease, right? You can break down the body and the body and the mind. We know how the body breaks down. Cancer, terrible illnesses. We know how the mind can break down, right? Uh, diseases of the mind, mental illness, schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, depression, anxiety can break down the mind. But you cannot break down the spirit. Spirit is not constrained to the here and now. Spirit is essentially transpatial and transtemporal. We talk about the defiant power of the human spirit, even in illness, even in sickness and, and in constraint, the spirit can still rise above that. It cannot be damaged or destroyed and does not become ill as opposed to the body and the mind. The spirit cannot become ill and as a potential, it is ever present, right? It's always there. It's always there. Sometimes, sometimes we can't always unlock it. Sometimes we can't always ignite it. We can't always find that, that dynamic spirit, but it's there. And sometimes going back to what I said earlier, that is the power of mentorship and coaching and psychotherapy of having somebody else help pull that out of you. And that does not have to be in mental illness, right? You don't have to be ill for that. Sometimes going back to one of these first points, local therapy is for healthy people too, to rise above. Yes, it's good for ill people, for physically or mentally ill people, but it's also good for healthy people to engage and to feel that existential dynamic, that tension between the here and now, where you are now and where you want to be. One of the resources of the human spirit is conscience. Conscience is not superego. That's a Freudian term. Beyond super, It is a meaning organ. I love that idea, right? Conscience is a meaning organ, which means that like an internal compass or an antenna, it is always oriented towards discovering meaning. Thus, conscience keeps a, keeps a link between spirit and meaning. And the cool thing about conscience is we can develop it, we can form it, we can shape it. It can be impacted by genetics, by environment, by ugly situations, by suffering, but we can always choose to cultivate it, to grow it, to strengthen consciousness, to strengthen that link between spirit and meaning. Spirit is that dimension through which human beings can rise above their psychological and physical dimensions and choose their position. In other words, to exist means to come back to oneself by rising above and beyond oneself and one's circumstances. That is the nature of spirit, to come back to oneself by rising above and beyond oneself and one's circumstances. We always have that choice. In illness, in cancer, in mental illness and struggle, I saw that. 
I saw that in the last moments of my mother's life. And I'm seeing that in my friend now. So I don't come at this from just a, a position of a textbook. But it's real. No matter what you're going through, that spirit is there. That ability to choose to rise above it is in you or in that person you care about. But sometimes it takes us, takes something to ignite that spirit. One of the capacities of the human spirit is to be with, be with, as in being with someone. Spirit has no time and space limits when it comes to being with. That sounds so metaphysical and voodoo, voodoo, but it's so real. The spirit can be with anybody. I can choose to be with my mom and my spirit and my mind and my heart, right? By remembering, by thinking back to the good days, by remembering those last words she shared with me. And you can do that with anybody you care about. Your body can't always be there. We may be separated by physical difference. Thank goodness we have Zoom now to be able to, to connect. But we always have a choice to be with those people we care about spiritually in our hearts. Our potential freedom, this is from Dr. Elizabeth Lucas. I love this point. Our potential freedom may be temporarily limited by illness, immaturity, senility, or can even be blocked by different situations. Our, our freedom can be temporarily limited. However, this does not change the fundamental existence of the human spirit and its dynamics. Even though we're limited, it's still there. I hear stories, wonderful stories lately, of a family dealing with their mother who has been digressing from Alzheimer's. And those moments of spirit that they see and that they recognize and that they, they feel, they experience, that is the heart of the human spirit. The mind and the body may be failing, but that spirit is still there. That person is still there. Those memories are still there. The spirit is not linked to space uh, uh, and time, but we can go back and remember. It's so important. The spirit is the source of our ultimate freedom and the window to eternity. So the resources, the toolbox of the human spirit. I'm going to share these with you and, and wrap up for today. The resources of the human spirit include our attitudes, our decisions of the free will, right? You hear me talking about choosing the meaning of the moment. We, that's part of our spirit. Choosing for me. I made the choice to, to be with my mom through hospice to be there with my dad in my last moments i'll never forget i also chose not to be here not to be there when she left she was an hour and a half away when i got that call i knew i wasn't going to make it in time and i think personally for me i wanted the last time i had with her i think it was either a day or two before to be that last time. And that was a choice. And for me, that was a meaningful decision. Other resources in our toolbox, intentionality, interests, those things that we find creative, those things we enjoy doing, ethical awareness, care for the environment, things like that, our awareness of our values, our search for meaning, and our belief. These are all resources of that human spirit. And so I implore you, if you're struggling accessing those resources, find somebody that can help. Talk, engage, read a book, check out a podcast. As I told you, I can't remember what the episode was. It was from January of 2022. Joe Rogan talking to Dr. Peterson. Say what you will about their beliefs or politicism, whatever it might be. It was a really cool podcast with some amazing insights. I highly recommend it. And Dr. Peterson talks about his battle 
with benzodiazepine addiction and how he came out of that just within the past year. Talk about accessing the human spirit. Um, I hope this was meaningful for you. Obviously, it was for me. I appreciate the opportunity to share a little bit of mental health and meaning with you. Um, hopefully, you got a little bit from the theory and the text and from me sharing. As always, I thank you for taking the time to listen or to watch. It's kind of my pleasure. It's my meaning to help you find meaning. I can't take ownership of that. That was actually Dr. Frankel and several of his books. So, hey, have a wonderful day, wonderful week. Can't wait to talk to you again sometime soon. Take care.